Okay, so this is not all of the legislation that was adopted in San Diego, but pulled the specific pieces of legislation that should be applicable to all of you in this room um, that have functions across campus. So the first one, recruiting, and we had some folks in admissions and enrollment management. This particular proposal had an immediate effective date, so it's been in effect since January. And what this says is that for your institution, it is permissible to place non-athletics advertisements in a high school or two-year college athletics publication. Probably most typically that's going to be a game program, but conceivably it could be other things as well. Um, we have defined this at this point pretty strictly to mean that if you have an athletic, if you have an advertisement, excuse me, that's a general advertisement for campus that has even a photo of anything athletically related, whether it's a field or a contest, um, that would not be falling under this particular exception. The mascot is fine. We've said the mascot is a general institutional identifiable um, symbol, and so that's fine if that's showing up in an advertisement. But this is really meant to be easier for all of you who have functions and don't just deal with athletics to make sure that you have as many outlets as possible to advertise the general institution as a whole, again with the caveat that the advertisement does not include any athletics information. So if you weren't already taking advantage of this, certainly by all means um, go right ahead moving forward. We have great relief from our three schools in Erie County over the past year. We're here to serve. Hopefully making it easier for our compliance folks too, having to monitor that. Question. Yes. If, you're, if your institution has a separate athletic logo versus a university mm -hmm. logo, is the NCAA looking at whether the athletic logo is used in the advertisement versus yeah. the university launch? Great question. So the question was, what if your institution has both an institutional logo and an athletics logo. What does that mean for this? It would mean that the athletics logo would not be able to be included. You would have to use your general institutional logo because again, that's athletics information. Great question. Yes. Yeah, the question was, is this just print advertisements or does this mean I can put up signs in high school gyms and all of that? Whatever you want. We're not regulating it. Have at it. Get as many people to your campus as possible. Just don't use athletics to do it. Okay? All right. Eligibility. This one is probably never going to be used by anyone in this room, but I want to make sure we cover it really quickly. So there is an exception to the initial eligibility requirements that says if you come in with, as a freshman, if you come in with 24, at least 24 credit hours of it, advanced credit, so AP, IB, however that's coming in, should for whatever reason the student not meet the traditional initial eligibility a student who comes in with at least 24 credit hours of advanced level college credit can be considered a qualifier and immediately eligible. So again, right, the whole goal here is academics. So if you're coming in with 24 hours of advanced standing credit, you're a quarter of the, not a quarter of the way, you're a fifth of the way there for most degree programs and we're thrilled about that. So we'll let you compete right away. So what this particular proposal did was make sure that that exception has a similar application for our international students. So it did two things. One, it defined what a similar proficiency examination is. Essentially it has to be um, administered on a national scale, has to be a uniform grading scale, and it has to be something that's taken after high school graduation. And then the certification of this, which, would, which was previously, the responsibility of you all on campus will now be done by the eligibility center. So you will no longer be have to figure out um, the number of credits awarded and whether or not the student can actually be certified as a final qualifier. Division one adopted this exception three or four years back. The eligibility center tells us that there has been one student ever that has used this. 
again, if you're coming in with that much advanced credit, you're probably a pretty good student in meeting the general initial eligibility requirements. But on the off chance that someone shows up to your campus with this type of profile, we want to make sure you're aware. Okay, path to graduation, probably the main reason everyone is here. So as, as Kathy noted earlier, um, how many of you have had the privilege the past several years of submitting the academic performance census data? Oh, not as, not as many, and you're still all smiling. That's good. So uh, there, there are questions as to why were we collecting that data? Seems like a lot of work, and I'm not seeing a whole lot out of it. What it did is it provided our research staff with the data to assess the academic performance of our Division II student athletes using Division II specific data. So as we move through all of this, there's one thing we really want to make sure that everyone solidly understands. This has nothing to do with how Division I kids are doing, nothing with how Division III. This was all based on the performance of our Division II student athletes. So that data has been immensely helpful in creating this whole uh, past the graduation package, which has been um, a long time coming and a lot, a lot of man hours put in by NCA staff, but, but more importantly our friends in the membership both on Academic Requirements Committee and the Academic Requirements Task Force. So there, are, there were five proposals voted on at convention. Um, four were adopted, which is really the most that could be adopted because there were two options um, for an annual credit hour requirement. And we all feel like, at least from a governance perspective, that this is putting Division II in a really good spot. We have demonstrated a commitment to making sure our Division II student athletes are continually making progress toward that degree, and we're putting ourselves in a position to really be a division that's appropriately valuing both athletics and academics. So the first proposal deals with freshman academic requirements. And essentially what this does is it establishes a double sliding scale model for initial eligibility. Um, for those of you that are familiar with the Division I legislation, they are moving to a two sliding scale model as well. They've always had the one. Um, they are picking up on what Division II has known for a while, that the partial qualifier, although they are not calling it that, has a lot of merit to it. Helps the kid get assimilated with a little bit, but not all full athletics access. But the key to note here is that they are separate sliding scales. So for those of you that have, how many of you have Division I sports? No, Kathy does. Handful of you. So for those of you that have a Division I sport, um, you're gonna have to make sure you're tracking on two sliding, two sets of two sliding scales. Um, keep, note that. So, and the sliding scale for qualifiers is going to increase the GPA requirement to a 2.2. So as you know right now, it is a 2.0. Um, the sliding scale for partial qualifiers will keep that 2.0 floor for those individuals. So there is no longer going to be the minimum cut score for test score. You're going to have to actually match up the GPA and the student's test score. Another change for partial qualifiers in order to be a partial qualifier, the student has to have those 16 core courses. So right now, if the student's not meeting the GPA, they can still be a partial based on their test score, right? In the, in the new world, effective 2018, your student's coming to you. So students who are enrolling in high school right now as freshmen for the fall, you can't calculate a GPA, a core GPA, without having the 16 core courses. So you're going to want to make sure that you're really tracking on the fact that they will have to meet both in order to have the sliding scale. Okay. This is just a small piece of the sliding scale. Um, we are in the middle of manual production. The manual will be available here in, in a few weeks. Um, and it will have the full sliding scale in it for you. So you can be tracking on these students early and often as they make their way through their high school careers in advance of 2018. But essentially you can see you've got your GPA for aid and practice and GPA for competition significantly higher. Not significantly, but 0.25 higher. Questions on freshman requirements? 
the eligibility center um, is going to do a pretty robust educational plan and outreach similar to what they've done um, for Division One's changes occurring in 2016. So uh, to be quite honest, I think right now the priority is Division One. Their date is coming faster, but the development of materials is happening and there will be quite the push to make sure campus, high school, coaches, associations, all of those groups are appropriately tracking on this. Um, the goal for 2018, as we will see as a common theme throughout all of these changes, is we don't want to see a single waiver with the rationale of I didn't know. Okay, So we're going to do everything in our power. If there are things that would be helpful to you in terms of resources, feel free to filter those through Carlin and I'll take those back um, to our staff to let them know. Yeah, so the question was, is the test score, is SAT score going to change um, as College Board updates the way the test is administered and scored? That is something that the Academic Requirements Committee will have to look at. Um, obviously right now they don't know what to do with it considering we haven't seen um, the distribution and how that ultimately ends up. But most definitely if they notice um, that the sliding scales need to be revised based on that change, um, you can rest assured they will. But even if, uh, regardless of the change that College Board is making on that, is there um, any change in the minimum SAT? I mean, excuse me, the minimum SAT or ACT coming in? Well, for 2016 and 17, no. So the cut scores to, uh, at this point are, are going to be what they are. Um, if we figure out something drastic on College Board, um, and I know those discussions are happening, so I apologize, I can't give you a great answer right now, um, but they're tracking on that. So part of it is just working with College Board to figure out how this is going to affect the cut scores and those conversations. Do you need to increase anything on the SAT, even if they're not making the change on College Board side? I don't want to make the uh, absolute statement that they're not looking to change it. I know that the research staff and ARC is very aware. I just don't know at this point. I'm not a liaison to that group, so I'm not sure what they are, what they are or are not doing as it relates to the 2016 change. But I can certainly take that back and filter that through Carlin. Yeah, we Car make a note of that for me. Thank you. And that Uh, well, it might be. Yeah, it, it just depends. I, I'll be honest, I know that there's changes coming. I don't know exactly what they are. So I don't know what the impact is on the current cut scores and the future sliding scale. I mean, conceivably, they, they may need to change both, but I'm not sure on that. Good question. Any other questions on the freshman academic requirements? Okay. So let's get into the fun stuff. Progress toward degree. So there were, as I noted, there were three progress or degree proposals. Um, two of them passed, so the, what, the way it was structured, there was one proposal with, uh, let's say, the more palatable items that everyone agreed with. And then there were two proposals pertaining to an annual credit hour requirement. One, the more strict requirement was defeated. Um, the, the less strict option was adopted. So we'll go through these together now. Um, for a while you were probably looking at them separately when they were in proposal form, but now that we know what we're dealing with, we'll look at them together. The first is actually not a change. So good academic standing is not changing. We're just moving it to a more prominent part of the manual to align with the progress toward degree legislation. What we heard, what the task force heard, is that institutions were not always tracking on the fact that if a student was not in good academic standing based on institutional policy for all students, that's where the analysis stops. You don't even look at NCA legislation at that point. If they're not in good academic standing at your institution, which is defined by your institution, not by the NCAA, you don't even look at anything else. So that's just being put in a much more obvious place. So if you're creating a checklist, that's what you're going to want to start with. The next piece is a change to what we currently know as the six-hour rule. Student athletes will now be required to earn 
earn nine semester hours per term for each full-time term of enrollment. This is the same thing actually for transfer students as well. So you know transfers are held to the same requirement of the six hour right now. It will increase to nine for them in 2016. 18 semester hour during the regular academic year. So if you have a student who is meeting nine after both terms, I wasn't a math major, but that gets you to where you need to be. So this is an easy requirement to meet if the student is meeting the term by term. If you have a student who has a hiccup in one term and only passes six, and then they're not eligible for the next term, so they had a lot of time to spend in study hall and then pass 12, that student is then meeting the 18 hour requirement. The regular academic year is defined as the first date of the fall term through your spring commencement exercises. So if you have a, what is sometimes called a J term in January in between your fall and spring semesters, you would be able to count credit hours earned during that term for purposes of meeting this requirement. If you have a May master that's after your spring term, you would not be able to use your May master hours. Okay? So this is truly during the academic year. What this did was essentially remove the current 75-25 rule, right? That requires you to earn at least 75% of your degree during the academic year. We want these kids to truly be students during the academic year, right? Not just playing summer catch up to earn that degree. So this was an alternative to limiting summer hours, establishing a requirement of you have to do this during the academic year. Again, hopefully if they're meeting the term by term, you're not even worried about this, but make sure you're tracking on that for those students that may slip up a term or two by term. So I think I just covered that. Moving on. Um, okay, so the, the question we get is, well, what happens if you have a mid-year enrollee? You can't very well expect um, Susie to come in and earn 18 credit hours during that spring term. Maybe Susie's an academic rock star and she can, but we won't expect that of our regular students. So to be honest, those individuals to an extent get a pass because they're not held to the 18, let's use this academic year as an example. You have a student athlete enroll spring of 14, okay? Earns the nine, it's a bad example because it's not effective, but work with me here. Um, spring of 14, earns the nine, doesn't meet the 18. You don't have to certify the 18 for a mid-year enrollee until after spring 15. So they are getting a little bit of a free pass, but the thought here is it makes it easier for all of you to not have to be tracking on your small handful of mid-years and having to do a mid-year 18-hour check. So hopefully that, that makes it a little easier for all of you. Um, but again, theoretically, if they're meeting term by term, after that second term of enrollment anyway, they have earned 18. You're just not required to certify it. Okay? 2.0 GPA. So right now, you yeah, have a phased in approach, right? We give them a little bit of break to start, 1.8, then 1.9, then 2.0. Starting with the fall term after the first initial year of enrollment, 2.0 GPA for that, from then until the end of their career. What we heard is that this is already the practical application of the GPA rule because again, going back to good academic standing, your institutions aren't letting these kids be out on the field with a 182. You need a 2.0. So this just streamlines it, makes it easier. You're looking for that 2.0 GPA for their entire academic career, okay? Um, it is possible if you have a student who you're, you go to certify them in the fall, they've got a 198. You say, sorry, you're not eligible for competition in the fall. They do really good work, again, got a lot of study hall time when they're not on the road. They do well, that GPA gets up to a 2-1. You can certify that student as eligible for the spring semester. 
you do not have to do the reverse and do mid-year GPA checks for all students or for all student athletes, bless you, unless that is institutional policy for all students. So if your good academic standing policy, for example, or your scholarship policy says all students have their GPA checked before the start of the spring semester and Susie ends up going from a 2-1 to a 1-9, Susie is not eligible for the spring. But if you don't have an institutional policy that says you have to do a grade check or GPA check, even if Susie drops to a 1-9, she can continue to compete. Again, hoping to reduce the burden on all of you to have to do those recertifications um, at mid-year. Any questions on the GPA piece? Okay. So the annual credit hour requirements, as I referenced, this was the, um, the second proposal that was adopted as it relates to annual credit hour requirements. The first was defeated. So I'm not going to make people raise hands, um, but, but let's just say this. I guarantee you if you do the averaging method in this room, at least 50% of you that are doing the averaging method are using it wrong. That became very clear um, in the task force's review. And part of it is admittedly because the language is complicated, doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but we see time and time again people are not applying the averaging method correctly. So the best way to ensure that people are certifying uh, student athletes correctly was to get rid of the averaging method entirely. The averaging method is, is its original intent was really meant to be that occasional get out of jail free card for a kid who was really doing things the right way and maybe just had one blip on the radar. And then institutions, which absolutely allowed to do, started using that as their actual way of certifying. And things went a little haywire somewhere along the line and people weren't really doing it right. So moving forward, again, this is a 2016 change. Student athletes will be required to earn 24 credit hours per year. So we just discussed the 18 during the academic year. So this essentially allows for a buffer of six hours during the summer if the student needs it. In years one and two, at the end of year two, say you have a student who came in, I'm going to challenge myself on the math here for a second. So freshman comes in, earns 15 and 15 in the first, in the first uh, year of enrollment. So 30 credit hours after year one. Year two is decided, I want to be in microbiology. Things didn't go quite so well. Struggled in some of the science classes meets the term by term and ends up with only 18. And then for whatever reason doesn't, doesn't enroll in summer school and, um, and comes up short on the 24. At the end of the second year, you can do a combination of the first two years. So it's not an average, it's a cumulative to say did this student earn 48 semester hours in the first two years of enrollment? If the student did, you can certify that individual as eligible heading into the third year. That is the one and only time the student can do that between years two and three. Every other time you're looking at an annual credit hour requirement of at least 24 credit hours per year. Again, in that first year, um, or if you choose to use the cumulative, after a year two, you can still use advanced placement hours like you do right now. So we certainly don't want to penalize students who are coming in with those good credits. But we're really focusing on making sure that that student on an annual basis is making progress toward that degree and isn't just essentially in the averaging method using that freshman and sophomore year to carry him through to his fifth year. Any questions on that? Yeah. I'm a registrar, okay. so excuse my naivete, but why did the uh, develop both an 18 credit hour rule and a 24 hour rule? Wouldn't a 24 hour rule in the, over the well, have total? Why didn't we just say 24 for the whole year? Move on. The, the real thought there is that we were seeing students um, who were not truly students during the academic year. So currently, you're only required to pass six per term. So you conceivably could have a student who is academically eligible for the whole year and only pass 12 credits during the year. 
and then go to summer school to make up for it all. Which, from an academic perspective, is not exactly what we want them to do. So this establishes a reasonable requirement during the academic year, which again, if they're meeting the term by term, they're automatically making. So we're not requiring them essentially to do anything additional, while still allowing them the opportunity to take summer hours if maybe scheduling-wise or um, academic talent-wise are not able to take and pass 12 and 12 in the traditional academic year. Good question. Any other questions on this one? Okay. Um, so when you're looking at transfer students, if they come in, you have to use, um, this is essentially for a student who maybe comes to you after year one. So if you have a student who comes, comes to you after year one, performs pretty well at your institution, in the, or well, let's say the other way, doesn't perform so well, again, only, only earns the 18, so they got the nine and nine for the semester, um, but doesn't have the 24 after year two. You're only looking at their academic record at your institution, so you don't get to go back to their first year at the other four year and do the combination. It is truly a reflection of their academic performance at your institution. Okay. All right. So this is a, a handy dandy chart, which again will be in the um, PowerPoint we sent to you. Probably just the most visual way to see all these changes and when things need to happen. So nothing changed in terms of when you're designating the degree. So that's still happening before you go into year three. Once you've designated the degree, all of these credit hour requirements have to be in degree applicable courses. Okay? So this is something you may just want to print this slide up and put it on a pin board near your desk um, so you can be tracking on it. You're also doing education with this. The key to note here is that this is for certifications for fall 2016. So what that means is when you're advising students to take particular classes for the 15-16 academic year, you're going to have to have these in mind, okay? Because that's what you're going to back and check your record based on. So you've got another year to advise on the current way, and then you're, you're going to have to switch gears a little bit. So any questions on the changes to progress toward degree? Okay. Um, again, as I noted, fall 2000. And real quick here before we give you guys a break, two-year college transfer requirements. So we spent a lot of time going through the current requirements this morning. And these are also changing effective 2016. So you're going to make sure you're appropriately tracking on this. The best way, and I know it's probably pretty small in the back of the room, the best way to understand this is to look at it in chart format. So there's three buckets. So again, we'll start on the right. Or we'll start on the left. So if you have a qualifier who attends a four-year institution before they come to you, hold on, strike that from the record. Let's try that again. If a qualifier who comes to you from a two-year institution who has never attended a four-year institution, they only spend one term at the two-year institution. So this is literally, you know, wanted to stay home for a semester, earn some gen eds, whatever the case is, but they were only one term and then they come to you. They're going to need to meet, again, the 12 semester transferable degree credits that we've continued to see, but the change here is the GPA, is going from a 2.0, which we covered earlier, to the transferable cumulative GPA of a 2.2, okay? And then additionally, when you're calculating the transferable GPA, and when you're making sure that they've got the 12 transferable degree credits, you can only count two PE activity hours. So not your theory courses, those are fine, those are actually academic classes, but the credit that the student athlete received for badminton and golf and underwater basket weaving, you only get to count two of those in the GPA and to meet the credit hour requirements. Now, if your institution is going to say, you know, the student took six, six PE activity credits, we're going to accept all six, and we're going to count them towards that student's degree, and we're going to check the boxes off, that's all well and good. We're not saying you can't ultimately count them toward your degree requirements, 
but for purposes of confirming the student has met the 2-4 transfer requirements, that's where you're limited to 2. Okay. As with any good rule, there is always an exception. If you have a student who is coming into your institution and has declared education, physical education, or an education major that requires PE activity hours, you are allowed to count up to the minimum number of those required by the degree program. So maybe they were, they're going to be a PE major at your institution, and the degree program requires four, the student took six, you're allowed to count four in that analysis. But that's the only exception to that. Would they have to officially declare that their major at the certifying institution? Yes. They, the question was, would they have actually had to have officially declared that at the in certifying institution? The answer is yes. The next question is, does that create a loophole? What if they, doesn't that mean if we have that major on our campus, that every 2-4 transfer should just come in as that, and then we'll change it a term down the road? It absolutely does. I'll be totally transparent with you all. But the hope is that you're not going to abuse this just as a way to count a couple of credit hours. You're going to make sure that the student is in a degree program that they actually want to be in. Because for education at all of our institutions, it is a free old requirement to be in that field. Well done. No drama in this conference then. Good. Appreciate that. That's helpful. Um, so then, now we will go to the right. So all other qualifiers, so if you have a qualifier who stayed at a two-year institution for more than just one term, as well as your partial qualifiers and non-qualifiers, if they graduate, that's still your golden ticket. So you get a piece of paper that says that student has an associate's, your analysis is done there. You're not calculating a GPA, you're not worried about PE activity hours, you're happy the student's coming in associate's degree. For everybody else, you're in the middle. So you're all other qualifiers who maybe have attended a four-year institution previously or were there for more than a term. You know, partial qualifiers and non-qualifiers who don't graduate, it's where it gets a little bit more of heavy lifting. So you, again, you're looking at the 12 semester hours of transferable degree credit for each full-time term attended, same credit hour requirement, so it carries over. So you still have the six of English and the three of math, but what's new here is three semester hours of transferable science. And what we mean by this is truly science, not your social sciences. So what the data showed in terms of the APC data that all of you submitted is that we thought we had it right with English and math, and those students who have that are coming in better prepared than those who don't. But the kids who are really nailing it at our Division II institutions are the ones that are coming in with a science class as well. So that is a new requirement. It does not have to have a lab. It can, but that's not a requirement. And again, it has to transfer into your institution as science. The thing here is that this is new in terms of the English math, or in terms of any credit requirement, for qualifiers. So right in the current legislation, the credit hour requirement um, in terms of English and math only applies to partial qualifiers and non-qualifiers. So if you have a qualifier now who has previous four-year attendance and doesn't fall into one of the other two buckets, that individual has to come in with those same courses. Okay. Same thing on the cumulative GPA of 2.2 and same thing with a limit on the PE activity hours. Stipulation on the GPA is that if you fall into this middle section here and the only thing you don't meet is the GPA and you have a GPA of a 2.0 to a 2.199999, 2 that individual can still be eligible for aid and practice during that first year. Just can't compete. Okay? I'm um, pretty sure I just said all that. Again, 2016 is what you're going to be tracking on. So, so two, two big dates. We got 2016 for the progress toward degree changes and 2-4 transfer changes and 2018 for your initial eligibility changes. 